I'm Howard Blumenthal, and this is the 17th episode of Reinventing School. Today we have a very unique group of people and also a very unique topic, which is cyber attack. So let's talk a little bit about what could happen, and hopefully our guest will talk me down from this extremely scary <laughs> position. Um, so let's say, for example, that there's a giant pandemic. And let's say that we have school districts that really aren't clear about how to do school when you're not allowed to go into school buildings or people get sick or they might get sick or the teachers don't wanna come in or whatever the combination is. And let's say that we're breaking a lot of the normal protocols when people are in school. So bad guys can enter the school really quickly through entrances that are usually guarded, but they're not right now. And the power goes out. And we find out that bad guys have attacked not only the electrical grid, which completely disables everything we do in the United States, just about, um, but also disables this whole internet idea. So distance learning is no longer possible and won't be for the next 10 years. So we can all be a little bit scared about that. If you want to add QAnon or anything else to the, to the stuff, that's fine too. Make it as big, a, 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 as gigantic a problem as possible. Um, so we should all be very scared or not. So let's break all that down because there's a lot of issues that are swimming around here. Some of them are based upon beliefs. Some of them are based upon an article I read or something I saw on Facebook or in social media. And I'm very confused about what reality looks like. Now, as it turns out, I think it was in March, and you guys will correct me. Um, uh, I read an article in the New York Times about this um, cyberspace solarium thing, a commission, and this congressman, and, and it's like, what is this? And this is not my world. So uh, I thought I would reach out, and um, sure enough, uh, Suzanne and Frank mm -hmm. and Mark uh, it, it kind of were kind enough to say, not only do we want to talk about this on Reinventing School, we want to brief you first so that you have a good sense of what it is we're talking about. And they're probably looking at me going, and let's see how crazy this guy is. So with that, um, one of you, please jump in and, and explain what is this report or commission all about and, and how did it come about and, and who are you guys? And feel free to you know, make it a conversation rather than a presentation. Sure. Uh, I'll jump in, but Suzanne, Mark, please uh, follow up. I, I mean, the commission uh, was uh, part of the National Defense Authorization Act of last year, John McCain's last bill. Um, it was basically a clarion call to uh, recognize that uh, we are vulnerable and susceptible to cyber attack. We had seen uh, a number of uh, successful attacks on the United States and that we needed a strategy to get our arms around all of these issues. So, it is somewhat unique in that it included members of Congress, so two senators, Republican, Democrat, two congressmen, Republican, Democrat. It included the deputy secretaries of some of the key national security agencies, such as the Department of Defense, Department of Homeland Security, the FBI director, and then a handful of us uh, on the near outside who, who uh, rounded out the group. I'm afraid, um, when you say it, what's the it in, in, in all of that? The it is to actually come up with a strategy to get our arms around the cyber threat. And, and it is important as a backdrop, since you sort of jumped on sort of worst case scenario, I think it's worth noting that not, not all hacks are the same, not, nor are all hackers. Intentions vary, capabilities vary. Uh, so it comes in various shapes, sizes, and forms. At the very high end of the threat spectrum are nation states. Think peer countries first and foremost, Russia, China. They're deeply engaged in espionage, whether political, military, or economic. Uh, they're also integrating cyber into their warfighting strategy and doctrine. Are Behind we, them- uh, As we're pointing fingers, does the United States do that as well, or? Yeah, clearly we've got uh, uh, very robust uh, okay. cyber capabilities, but rules of engagement are a little different. We mm -hmm. adhere to a, a whole different host of, of rules and engagement in terms of how we engage in computer network attack and exploit. But I, I think the, the bottom line is, is the bar is really low for individuals to have a cyber capability. So when you're talking about the Russias and the Chinas, when you're talking about actual attacks that could be regionally disruptive to the grid, that's a very small club. Uh, does it exist? Yes. 
But underneath that, you have nation states that lack capability but have intent, Iran, North Korea. But most what you're seeing, mostly what you're seeing are criminal enterprises. In the COVID environment, you're seeing a huge spike in theft of intellectual property, theft in research around uh, uh, COVID, and fraud uh, around COVID. Everyone's popping up uh, a website a day trying to commit and perpetrate fraud as the country's obviously concerned and scared about uh, how they address some of these issues. And then you've got kids. You've got, uh, uh, I think when it comes to schools, that's not going to be the primary concern of a nation state necessarily, but it certainly would be what is the cyber equivalent of pulling the fire alarm during exam day? Zoom bombing. We've already seen this. I, I think you're going to see more of this, and, uh, and it's not something today. we need to take seriously. Right, hopefully, hopefully not, not while, while we're on today, right. exactly. Yeah. But I've spoken too much. <laughs> um, Mark, so, Suzanne, Mark, Mark, Suzanne, yeah, just jump in. Tell us a little bit more about the, how this activity kind of came together and how you guys have been working with Congress, right? Well, it was actually established by Congress. So it was Congress that decided that they wanted to set up this group. And the name Solarium is an odd one. You know, there are lots of commissions set up by Congress, the commission on this and the commission on that. You know, I've been on uh, work with several commissions. The Solarium term goes back to Eisenhower. Uh, and it's actually named after a room in the White House. Because I, I was going to say it's a room, right? It's like a patio that's enclosed, right? <laughs> We're the Sunroom Commission. Uh, and, and the solarium was the room that Truman liked to have meetings, usually with outside experts, with, you know, when he would have uh, outside folks from outside the administration, and he would often meet with them in the solarium. This act, this meeting that triggered, you know, the use of this term in our title really was with, was actually with his insiders, with his inside national security team. And, uh, you know, folks like John Foster Dulles, uh, you know, the, the, the big names, his national security team uh, that he called in. And this was just a few months after Stalin had died. Um, so we're talking 1953, I think that was, Mark. Um, and, and Eisenhower recognized, all of them recognized that they were at an inflection point and we, we had an opportunity to really now uh, think about our strategy with Russia and the Soviet Union going forward. Um, and, and, and he knew we had lots of different viewpoints about this. There was no coherent strategy. There was no consensus around the strategy. And he, he had developed a kind of process, forced a process. Where right, well, let me stop you for a sec. Take me back to school, right? Take me back to I'm really scared. <laughs> um, because that's kind of, you know, a, a, it's a little more comic book fun, but also how realistic are any of the things I talked about? Mark, can you jump in? Uh, so I, I think, I think that there is a, there's and risk. Tell us about right? you first. I'm sorry. Yeah. Oh, good. Sorry. I'm, uh, you know, uh, Mark McGarvey, I'm the executive director. I actually worked for Senator McCain when this was set up in the Senate and, uh, and Senator King and Representative Gallagher, who are the chairman of the, uh, of the, uh, Commission, two of the two of the gentlemen that Frank referred to as you know the, of the four congressional. I should mention one of our, our third ones, Jim Langevin, who's probably the congressman with the most cyber chops across either chamber, either party. Just you know, twenty years of of uh, of dedicated work on this uh, from a Democrat from Rhode Island. But um, so I came in to be the executive director, which is basically herding cats underneath the commissioners to you know, get uh, decisions for them to, you know, decision products for them to take, uh, to rule on. Because I, the other thing McCain did is he said, you have one year. Now we had one congressional year, which means you start six months late and finish uh, three months later than that, you know? So, I mean, it's, it's about 20 months, but the reality is we, uh, we were set up to, um, to rapidly deliver. And we did, I mean, to, to give you an example, you drive everything by budget. We came in about 25% under budget, makes me feel good. But the idea was when McKay set up, he was worried about the worst case things you talked about. But what really got at him was this, the persistent attack levels. So Frank was talking about things that don't necessarily turn the lights off on the Northeast power grid and take down power to all of New England, but the kind of persistent um, Chinese intellectual property theft you know, we've studied it over the last two decades. Other commissions have studied it. And it's, we're talking in the you know, totality over two decades, trillions of dollars of unrealized GDP growth. Okay, but let me stop you for a second. But the person who's watching this is a school teacher. 
yeah. going, am I going to be able to teach the kids? Like, I, I, it's, it's impressive, yeah. the larger scale issue, but the issue that we're focused on specifically in this series is mm -hmm. how does it affect learning in schools? Frank? Howard, can I just jump in? Because, because I mean, I think a more pragmatic, pragmatic, realistic, and something we've seen over and over are ransomware attacks on on school districts and the school systems. In 2019, there were over a thousand ransomware attacks that are public, and as we all know, in most cases, you don't go public uh, in terms of some of your uh, uh, cyber attacks. So you saw a huge spike on healthcare and uh, and in schools in particular. Why? the old Willie Sutton principle, I rob banks, that's where the money is. In this case, the reality is, is they're vulnerable. They have not spent the same uh, amount of money and, and have not devoted the resources. So state, local, tribal, and territorial entities in particular have been primary targets in the crosshairs and schools are far behind some of the other sectors. I think they've learned since COVID that uh, cyber is clearly a, a priority or they can't do their business, they can't teach. Right. But uh, I still think they've got a ways to go. So I'm sure. not as worried about that catastrophic attack, but you don't need to engage in a catastrophic attack. A small scale attack can have huge impact on delivering school and education. Vicki, you're still a student, yes? Yes, sir. Okay, what year are you in? Um, I'm a junior at Auburn. Okay. And Auburn is, explain for folks who don't know where Auburn is, where, where is that? So I like to describe it as in Alabama where they have the point that kind of goes into Georgia. It's really close to there. There you go, thank you, very good. And uh, so what do you, uh, I, I wasn't expecting to see you. Um, what's a nice girl like you doing in a place like this, right? <laughs> Tell us about how you, how, what attracts you, what, what interests you about all of this? And I'm going to ask the question, which is the obvious one. Are there a lot of women involved in this? Or is this mostly a guy thing? And Suzanne, you're going to hopefully jump in on that as well. But Vicki, explain to us what the culture is like around this. I believe that it's getting better, but it definitely still is male dominated. And I have a lot of ideas of how like we can get the future generation like more involved, more women. I think there should be like more representation because whenever you see movies and in media, there's like the hacker and it's like a, a dorky, like either high school boy in his mom's basement with like Mountain Dew and everything, or it's like a middle-aged mom also in his mom's basement. So I think like more representation in the media would be a good way to further that as well as having women in this field go and talk to like even elementary schools just so girls can see themselves in the field. How did you get involved in this? Tell us about your background. So um, my dad was a programmer. And so I decided to take a programming course in eighth grade as an elective. And everyone else was struggling with like breaking everything down into small steps for the computer to understand. And it just made sense to me and I enjoyed it. And that's when I realized that's what I want to do. Something but, big, computers. but isn't there a big space between I'm going to code and I'm going to take on cybersecurity as a career? That seems like a big leap. Yes, sir. So my stepdad, he was telling me like all these different options in the technological field and he mentioned cybersecurity and it sounded really interesting. So he got me like a bunch of books on it and everything. And so that was really an important part. So how do you break down my crazy list of threats at the beginning? Do you, I mean, is this stuff you hear all the time? Is it, oh, this guy's out of his mind, it'll never happen? It's, or is it like, wait, some of those things actually I'm a little scared about too. So how, how does it fit together for you? Well, at first it seems like, oh, that's insane, like that could never happen. But then whenever you think about it, it does happen like every single day. So this definitely could happen and at some point probably will. Thank you. Charles, uh, you are a student as well. You're a senior, if I remember, also at Auburn, right? Yes, sir. Okay. So can you break this down for me? Which of the threats that I talked about are something that if I'm running a school or I'm a student, should I actually be focused on? Are these large threats real? Are they highly unlikely? Are they very likely? What do I need to worry about? What do you worry about? Um, and, what, and by the way, how did you get involved in doing all this? A lot of questions. 
Um, I guess I'll start with how I got involved. Um, I started building a computer uh, maybe when I was about 16 years old and kind of enjoyed the process, wanted to learn how it worked under, well, how, how a computer worked from there. Um, and at the time I was actually working a job and it took me about two years before I, I got involved in uh, computer science specifically in programming. So I, I took some, some online free courses like the MIT, uh, I forget what it was called, but essentially I was living in Auburn at the time and we had in-state tuition. So I, I started going to Auburn. Um, out, of, out of all the threats you've described, the, the most realistic to me is probably the power grid. Uh, just because uh, these systems are so vast and so spread out, um, I think it's pretty likely that it's hard to monitor these vast, vast systems. Uh, and, you know, we, we've seen attacks in other nations where they've taken down the entire power grid for weeks at a time. So it's a, it's a real possibility that that could occur. Um, we've seen threats on the American systems. Uh, from foreign nations already. Uh, you've probably read that in the news. Uh, it just keeps on happening. We keep on finding APTs or advanced persistent threats within our own systems. Um, as far as what would affect the general public or just citizens, I would say ransomware is a big one. Uh, just because uh, it, a lot of the attackers uh, are like uh, Mr. Khalifa said, um, are focused on vulnerable people. So it's usually focused on uh, cities. You saw Atlanta get taken down in the past. Uh, I, I forget what, how, how recent that was, but it, it cost millions of dollars to, uh, to fix that. And I think they actually had to pay the ransom uh, to get that fixed. But uh, it, it focuses on vulnerable prey. So uh, as far as fixing that, I would say teaching digital hygiene um, and just kind of focusing on just kind of common sense within the computer and cyber space. So we'll get into specific problems and remedies shortly. Oh, okay, sorry. So, and I do wanna go deep on that. Suzanne, take me through the power grid. And, and what I need to understand is um, in the New York metropolitan area, uh, uh, within the past month, as a result of a hurricane, we had no power at you know, relatives' houses and the like uh, for five days, but the power company couldn't tell them when things were going to go on again or if things were going to go on again. And it seems to me that Hurricane Sandy wasn't all that long ago when similar things happened. So if those are two acts in a very large area, you would think, or at least I would think, that they would have gotten their act together and that it wouldn't be so much of a threat. If we know that that can happen, and I'm a bad actor somewhere, I'm thinking, well, how do I do that? Not necessarily with a hurricane, which is harder to pull off, but with some technology situation, how fragile is this? And, and if you can give it to us sort of overall and then take me down to at my local elementary school, yeah. my local high school, right? Surprisingly, uh, and frankly, and Mark may disagree. My my work with the electric uh, companies and and looking at that sector, when I was at the Department of Homeland Security as the Undersecretary responsible for critical infrastructure protection and cybersecurity, um, I came away uh, with an appreciation that our electric grid is really much more resilient than people give it credit for. But then why five and days? What? And interestingly, it's actually I think harder to create an extended uh, widespread outage through cyber than it is through a hurricane or through some other physical sabotage. Because uh, actually physically, you know, finding down wires, um, waiting for conditions to be safe, getting through the transportation where the trees have fallen on the road, you know, there are lots of complications involved in restoration of power. I am not making excuses for why it would take a week or more to restore power. Uh, Believe me, uh, I agree with you that they should be better prepared for these sorts of things by now. But what I would say is um, there are lots of uh, redundancies built into our electric grid 
uh, it, that make it hard for an adversary to take out the power for an extended period of time. And I will give as an example, um, Charles talked about other countries that have suffered attacks on their electric grid um, two days before Christmas uh, in uh, December 23rd. What year was that, Frank? 2015. 15 was the first first one. They hit it again the following year. But yeah. yeah. Uh, power went out for a quarter of a million customers. Uh, and that was in outside of Kiev in Ukraine. And it was a cyber attack. But they managed to get the power back on in six hours. Not because their cyber ninjas, their IT folks, got the bad guys out of the network and got the network back up, but because what the bad guys had done was to cause a physical, a, a consequence in the physical world. They had gone into the computers, the computers controlled switches that were geographically dispersed around the service area, and they had, using the, their access to the computer, they had flipped the switches causing an overload and causing the power to go out. The way they got the power back on is they got guys who knew where those switches were, not the IT experts, but the, but, but the line people who lay the wire and what have you. And they got in trucks, they drove to where those switches were and they manually put them back in place and they were able to get the power back on. When we tried to construct scenarios to cause an extended power outage for a long period of time, we had to combine physical and cyber. Now it could be done, right? An adversary takes advantage of a hurricane, for example, or combines physical attacks on those who are going to do the repairs uh, with cyber, with, you know, those kinds of things can be done, but an extended outage uh, is really hard to do. But Howard, your point really to, could, the, could, could we lose internet connection for some extended period of time and what should we do and how do we have the kind of resilience and redundancy in our schools with regard to teaching and distance learning et cetera, that we have in the electric grid that's really the key key question right well, start and start let's break that down a little bit let's just start with internet so you describe that if i'm understanding you correctly the electrical grid has enough physical structure and redundancy that if there is a problem, there are enough knowledgeable people who can be on site to correct it. So the outage may happen, it's more likely to be regional than national and all that. My impression with the internet is there is no internet. There's a lot of pieces of interconnected networks, but it seems to me that you could just sort of send some bad juice down one pipe and all of a sudden it's in a lot of pipes. Is yep. that an utter lack of understanding of how the internet works or? No, not really. And we've, and we've seen those sorts of things happen. I mean, you, you and again, they're generally relatively short lived, but, um, but you, you could remember days when suddenly uh, you couldn't access a lot of popular sites, right? You couldn't get to PayPal or you couldn't get to um, Google or you couldn't right. get you know, whatever. And, and those are because uh, often, uh, occasionally, because someone has figured out how to muck up the works, if you will, um, using something that, for example, in one case, they use the, the, what is basically the telephone directory for the internet, uh, a mechanism by which when you send something, then you want to go to either a website, typically it's if you want to go to a website, you enter that, you know, uh, schools.com, mm -hmm. um, there's, a, there's a mechanism that turns that into digits and finds where that is and routes it and sends it. And if you mess up with the phone directory, for example, you can, you can frustrate a lot of online activity. So there are- but, but that's on the sort of internet management, data management side, right? Uh, what about the physical uh, structure that the internet uses to move things around? So you sort of have a lot of different components in the internet and you also have sites. So I was a, a senior executive at one of the larger websites at one point. And we would get attacked periodically and we would take appropriate measures and we'd be down sometimes, but mostly we were up. Okay. And that's going to be true of any enter internet enterprise, whether it's somebody's blog or it's something larger, but what about the internet itself? If I can describe it that way. I, I'll jump in on yeah, that. I'll, and, and I'll uh, follow up. Yeah. yeah the well, first I would say, I, I worry much more about what Suzanne was getting at, which is the data. Uh, Howard, I really don't think, you know, one thing about the internet is it is extremely resilient. 
there are millions of different pipes and ways to get around information, you know, uh, to, so that your phone works. Now, if the absolute cell tower closest to your phone is physically disabled or disabled, either physically or through some some sort of a cyber attack, then you would you might lose some coverage or the quality of your coverage. But I have two kids in high school. If I know I'm reasonably understanding of Canvas and how Canvas connect Canvas system connects to their uh, their grades, you could really put the lean on a school by uh, lock you know through a ransomware attack locking up that that or, or threatening to erase it. I don't I've never noticed a paper backup for all the things that are going for for you know the transcripts and all that. You would put you would put a school that has zero money to pay ransom. You know, if you think about excess money floating around element, you know, public schooling system to pay a ramps. And they, the only reason they aren't getting ransomware attacks is that it isn't where the money is. You know what I mean? Just legitimately it would be very hard for them to get to it. On the other hand, when we talk about disaffected um, act, single actors, the tools that are available to do that kind of ransomware are available to all of us and probably usable by the younger versions of us on this uh, panel, you know, that they could go out there and the vulnerability of our systems uh, is increasing in a way that with the availability of these tools, the vulnerability increasing. I think that's the actual most, you've hit on what is the most likely thing. It's what Suzanne said, it's the data more than is there a Wi-Fi signal or you know, uh, near me in the school. I really think it's the data. Okay. And the Howard, can I, can I jump in on that? Sorry, yeah, go ahead, Frank. No, no, I was going to say the integrity and the confidentiality and the availability of the data comes in various forms. Um, and we have seen data being manipulated, which I think is a significant concern. But let me just, and it's not that I disagree with my colleagues here, it all depends on the intentions of the adversary. So if we're talking about Russia or China and they're looking at a military set of issues, they are going to integrate cyber into their war fighting strategy and doctrine. It's not going to be a cyber unique, but it's going to enhance the lethality of some of their conventional. So these capabilities do exist. But if we looked at this problem purely from a vulnerability standpoint, we're never going to sleep because the reality is, is we're high, highly vulnerable and susceptible. What we really need to do is take a hard look at a risk based approach. So the, the national security agencies do have to focus on the Russias and the Chinas of the world. But I think by and large, what we need to do is raise all boats, because right now you've got a discrepancy between the lifeline sectors, what you would call financial services, uh, uh, energy, uh, defense industrial base, transportation, telecommunications. But underneath that, there's nowhere near the level of capacity we need to get to. Because if you look at the grid, when you say Suzanne capacity brought we this need up. to get to, what do you mean by capacity we need to get to? So resources, prioritization, it needs to be a board set of issues, not just push down to the geek who is responsible for all this. And I don't mean that in a pejorative way. This has to be a primary issue. And you touched on workforce. I'll just give you a sense that the, the, the deficit between supply and demand is staggering. It's over 500,000 unfilled jobs in the United States. That so are related Vicky and Charlie, to... you're going to be in great, you're going to be in a right. great position around cybersecurity. But let so... me also say that diversity is a huge issue. So women make up less than 25%. So Vicky was being kind. I think we need so many more women. That is a huge workforce that is not being brought into this fight. And we need to get more U.S. citizens involved in this issue from day one, from K through 12. So I, I don't mean to, so, so all I'm really getting at is, is if you look at it on what's possible, we might as well all give up. If you're looking at how you can start addressing managing risk and taking steps to, to minimize the consequences and building resilience into our system, then I think we've got a different set of issues on our hands. So schools, it's largely going to be people who, quite honestly, it's going to be a lot of the students themselves who are probably going to be, at some point, hopefully the solution, but also some of the problem, because there are a lot of pranksters out there as well. There's a great deal of hygiene that's involved in the problem solving, right? Or at least the prevention. And because as a nation, we've been so good about hygiene related to the pandemic, I have every reason to believe we should be optimistic. With that, we're going to take a break. We'll be right back.
we talked about this top down. We got Russia, we got China, we got electrical grid. Let's talk about this bottom up. So I now have a Chromebook in the house. I've got a cell phone. I'm not really going to school. The school gave me this stuff. I don't completely understand how it works, nor do I have an interest in learning. I just want the internet to stay up. I need to be, to be I just don't want to be bothered by my kids because I'm trying to get my own work done. And if there's a problem, please don't bring it to my house, right? So that requires a fair amount of very simple devices. Let's start there. It would be great if the, if the devices were more on the impenetrable side and, and easier to use. Um, but it also requires an understanding of what hygiene is necessary, what good practices are necessary, and then being able to get people to actually participate in those good practices. And before the break, I made a joke about people not being willing to wear masks. It's a heck of a lot more complicated to install some sort of anti-ransomware or whatever it is you want to put on a computer. If we can't get people to wear masks, why should we even begin to think that this is going to be a situation that we're going to be able to put ourselves into in, in the right way? Charles, help us. You're, you're kind of closest, I think, to, or Charles and Vicky, closest to the kid who is in the house, who is, like, what are you seeing? Um, I, I honestly, I don't think digital hygiene is that hard. Like you're saying, I don't think it's hard to practice it. It's just kind of common sense that it, it's just something you, we should educate, uh, the, the new, uh, new wave of kids in school, the K through 12, uh, it's just, you know, using safe passwords, not reusing passwords. And there's lots of things that make it easy that are available. Uh, to everyone for free. Give us a sense. Like what? You, you get practical for us. Uh, password managers. Uh, so you you can get a password manager like LastPass or Bitwarden or just something that you can put on your browser as an add-on. It'll generate the passwords for you. Uh, it'll make passwords that are safe. Uh, it'll keep track of all of the, the different uh, I, okay, I so, so you good have. password yeah. management, headline number right. one. Good password, what's number two? Uh, don't post everything about your life on social media. Um, that's, okay, if, if you're talking about targeting people, uh, social media is the first place you go. Uh, so you, if, if you're posting everything about yourself on Facebook, uh, someone, some stranger might be able to just look up your name and figure out, things about you, uh, all your so friends. Where does, where does stranger danger fit into this? Is this because I'm afraid I'm going to be kidnapped? Is this because I'm afraid that somebody's going to, what? Like, what's the threat that, because when I talk to kids, and I talk to a lot of kids around the world, yeah, we know stranger danger, and we don't want to put this stuff because we don't know, we don't want people to know where we live and all that. But most abductions are done by people they know. So that's really not so much of an issue, right? So what is the issue there? And Vicky, you want to jump in? It's phishing, right? It's social engineering. Yeah. How, how so? Vicky, get, take us through this. So if you put all of your information like online or if you post everything on Facebook, like you can use that information to manipulate people into thinking that um, you have the authority because you know things about them. And you can also, like, if they don't have like, a password manager and if they're not very careful with their passwords, you can fig probably, you can figure out their password much more easily. So if I knew your password, what damage could I do? You could do a lot of damage because- Tell me, I mean, to you. What, what? You could get into their bank account. Okay. But doesn't the bank have some sort of a prevention of some sort or- the, my liability is limited the bank will take the rest of the liability. Why is that a problem? Is it a problem? Suzanne, I, I you want to jump in? Not. Well, I think the thing that individuals, uh, the, the greatest harm that I, uh, comes to individuals is identity theft, which is very, very difficult to unwind. Um, so someone not just sort of one time accessing your, your uh, account, for example, but actually opening up lots of credit cards in your name, et cetera. And, and that is just really a nightmare. 
you're absolutely right, Howard, though, that, that um, because of think policies that have been put in place, the consequences for individuals of these breaches, for example, the Home Depot or Equifax or any of these things, it's really been limited. Uh, and I do think that it's part of why individuals are not willing to invest a whole lot in, in cybersecurity and in cyber hygiene because they haven't, we have a disconnect between the people who may, people who may be in a very good position to help secure our internet at the end, at these, what we call endpoints, which is human beings at, at their laptops and on their phones, and where the consequences of failing to do that fall, right? Hey, Howard, can I? Yeah, Howard, can I jump in on yeah, Bill please. and Charles and Vicky? They said the exact right thing: password management, limiting your, you know, your how much you show in a, in public facing social media. The third thing I'd say is multi-factor authentication. Two-factor. You know, your least. back. Yeah. Your bank asks you to do that all the time. You probably hit no later. Um, you know, a lot of people do that. That multi-factor authentication, when added to, to, um, to Charles's password, uh, pa password protection and Vicky's don't show too much in the public, you're protected against 99 point some high, nine right. percentage likelihood. The final one I'd say is phishing. And I think Charles or Vicky mentioned it earlier that you don't, you can't, you can't just hit any link that comes in from anyone, even a, a, link, a link from someone you know, when you read the, the, the actual website, you know, make sure that you're comfortable with that. Because if, and if you do those four things, you're, you're responsible about phishing, you have multi-factor or at least two-factor authentication, you have good passwords, and you keep your public-facing data reasonably protected, you will be safe. Okay. I mean, you really so will. It, it would be Most something else. Most of the time. Can, can I add? Can I add one? Yeah. Just a, a couple of things. I, I agree with everything that has been said here, but but a couple of things to worry about when your identity is stolen. So, for example, years ago, you used to be able to in the deep web darknet, which is sort of like the old Star Wars bar scene where you've got Han Solo and people with eleven arms and seventeen eyes. That's where a lot of this data is being. That's shared. real. It's actually real. Cool. So uh, you don't the want Star to Wars bar, the dark net. You don't want to. Oh. Hang out there. So, so actually, most people don't realize only about eighty-eight percent of the internet is actually categorized. So Google, much of it is underneath. So it doesn't have. Uh, uh, you can't search. It doesn't have search functions. But it used to be that credit card numbers used to go for ten dollars per stolen credit card number. Now, because the credit card companies are so good from an artificial intelligence and machine learning standpoint, they go for, you need thousands for pennies. So it, it, it was not a very smart business decision, but almost overnight, you saw the criminals move to healthcare fraud. And in particular, juveniles, those that aren't looking at their credit, so those healthcare records of individuals, whether you have social security and other sorts of issues, and I think the social security numbers should be dead because that literally, we have so much dependent upon that. But if you look at how much fraud is perpetrated there, it's big money. And, and here's the bottom line. These kids are gonna be, it's really hard to disentangle and untangle that after the fact. So your credit scores drop, your ability to get into college or get a job or go to community college, all of that is affected by this. So it is not trivial. If you take all of the steps that Mark and Charles and Vicki and Suzanne had mentioned, you are gonna to get to that 80% solution, which is good enough. The one thing I will note though is phishing expeditions, even the most sophisticated espionage campaigns aimed at the US government are often initiated by a fishing expedition. And here's what I'm gonna say, they're getting so darn good, all of us would have a very hard time delineating and differentiating a hostile versus an actual email. So let's wrap this into school curriculum, because it seems to me that many of the kids that I talk to, probably most, um, Password management, don't tell your password, use different pa Yeah, got it. I think I, I think if I talk to a nine-year-old, they're going to be like, I, I already understand. Move on. Okay. Um, phishing. But they're still using their careful. pet's names. Huh? And <laughs> but they're still not, using their pet's they names. They understand it. I'm not sure that they're doing anything about it, but they yeah. understand it. That, okay. Yeah. I, I think that the, um, you know, that, that sort of the, the other pieces that you describe, um, don't put too much personal information 
up and, and all that. Okay, again, I understand and different people do different things. Okay, but multi-factor um, auth authentication, I got it out, um, is, um, is more sophisticated and a little more difficult to understand and a little bit more of a pain in the neck. So you don't necessarily, so we don't necessarily have that education. So here's my question. Is this something that every year, every school, every teacher should go, you know what, let's just talk this through again, share stories. Oh, my aunt got her um, identity uh, taken, whatever it is, so that it becomes front of mind again, because it's very easy to forget about it, I would think. So how do you build that into the normal routine of is it monthly? Is it weekly? Do we start the day and do the Pledge of Allegiance and then we talk about cyber attacks? Like, how do you, how do you organize it? So, What's the curriculum and how do you deliver it? Yeah, so in terms of the curriculum, there uh, I, I, for teachers who are watching, um, if you haven't already, uh, you should go to the DHS.gov website and look for CTAP. C -E -T oh, slow down. What's DHS? DHS, Department of Homeland Security. Okay, and then the next part? So dhs.gov and look for, um, there are materials there for teachers, for K through 12 teachers who would like to know, get some materials so that they can talk to their students and, and try to educate them on cybersecurity. It's called the Cyber Education and Training Assistance Program. Uh, so it's C, Cyber Education, E, Training and Assistance Program, CTAP. Uh, and, and they're really very good materials, as I say, for K through 12. So in terms of content, there's a lot of good stuff out there. Now let's take this a step up the ladder. So now we've got kids and we, students, and we also have parents that a lot of this applies to, right? But let's go one or two steps beyond that. How do you deal with this at the school level, at the school district level? And let's just keep it there for a second. So. How do you go, how do you just go about, what do we need to be thinking about? What are the threats? How do we make sure that we're addressing the threats? And how crazy does this get? So I think, Mark, I'll pick up and say that CTAP is first the, the first thing. And it's actually got classes too. But here's the sad thing. We've got 20,000 high school teachers are taking it. And I thought that's a lot. Mm -hmm. Then someone brought me right. some mathematics and explained right. that was 4.7%. Yeah, exactly. And, it, and with turnover, that number is just going down. So. We absolutely, we've, uh, Suzanne and, and Frank as commissioners have recommended and we're at, enacting, trying to get more funding for that so that that number can go up. So the first thing's that, but in addition for, now district leadership, you kind of move over now. Now it's not DHS, Department of Education really has this. And I gotta be honest, the, the federal government's really out of its lane here. You know, we're sticking our fingers into what is intrinsically a state local issue, but we're sticking them in there anyway. The government's doing it. The federal government's doing it. And there's something called, uh, you know, where DOE has began to partner with EduCause uh, to try to help push the idea of CISOs. We found that- CISOs? Whoa, 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 that was a so lot of- Cyber- <laughs> all, that, all, all, that acronyms. Acronyms. all those words, right? <laughs> so these are cyber information security officers, the people who are in charge of cyber security. You know, at best, at best, they're at the- um, they're at the district level and not at the high school level. We recognize that they actually need to be pushed all the way down to the high school level. And we did an interview, I think uh, it was 300, and, um, I wanna say we interviewed 350 district leaders. 80% knew something was wrong and 80% were sure they weren't doing enough. And unfortunately it was the same 80%. I mean, this is four <laughs> out of five schools know something's wrong and no, and they don't know how to do it. And then, and then I think we looked at 500, we talked to, 515 one level down technology leaders who actually knew what was wrong, but again, higher than 80% felt they weren't being given the resources to take care of. Yeah. It was like 88%. So these numbers are just brutal. There is no, and who would, the, the funding for this is, is, is limited. As I said, Department of Education can't directly give it. They basically had to stand up an NGO, hand the money to them. You know, we're talking inefficiencies here to try to get this available. So. I think the teachers one, what, what um, Suzanne said, and I'll use that acronym, CTAP, really is the is part going to be part of the solution. And we're pushing hard for legislation this year to really make it more robust. But that Howard, district I, one, you're spot yeah. on. On we're we're way behind. Howard, I just wanted to build on Mark and Suzanne's point. I, I 
to your initial question, cybersecurity is everyone's business, whether it's the parents, whether it's the teachers, whether it's the administrators, or whether it's the students. I personally feel there are two things every American, I mean, they need to understand uh, a little bit about the country and the world and, and their place in it, but I think they also need to get some cybersecurity awareness education, basic life support. These are, these are things that will be valuable skills and cyber has to be integrated into that, not because of the computer science piece alone, but rather cyber transcends everything everyone does in society. So I actually think the old adage, what gets measured gets done. Yes, but we need to make sure we're measuring what matters. And I think if you start having that conversation between teachers, parents, and students, uh, not from the administrators alone, but actually in the classroom, I think we've got a long way, we've, we've got a ways to go there. And there are two countries I'm very close, to, I, I've seen closely how they do it. Israel and Estonia. These are two was, very I mean, small say countries. Estonia. Right. Two explain, very small countries in Explain tough Estonia and why Estonia. Actually, I'm going to I'm going to come back to Estonia in a second because yeah, I want to ask Vicky okay. a question first. I don't want to lose this track. Please. Um, so, Vicky, you're a senior in college now, right? A junior. Junior in college. Okay. Back it up five years. You would have been a sophomore in high school. Yes, sort of, something like that, right? believe so, or a Yeah, junior. something like that, right? But you would have been in high school. Did you know a lot about this stuff, passwords and things at that point? I knew like a lot of the don't reuse passwords, yeah. that sort of stuff. All right. So let's assume that you were interested enough to get a little bit of education on your own. As the student, as students in your school or in elementary school, boy, I'd much rather listen to you talk about this than I would a teacher who kind of brushed up on the internet yesterday and went, you know, and, you, and then like the kids are like, she has no idea what she's talking about. Um, but you have credibility because you're studying it and also because you can talk, you can relate in ways that aren't. So why aren't students teaching this to other students, so like older students to younger students? It seems to me that that would be far more effective than having a teacher who really doesn't know this stuff. There's some teachers do, but is this really something we want to have the teacher learn and then pass on when there's other people in the building who are really good at it? It doesn't make any sense to me. It makes a little sense to me. Vicki, what do you think? I think that that's a really good idea. We just need to get better at um, implementing that. And I think that the students who do know and are willing to help teach like their peers and younger students need to step up and like put some pressure on the administration to do that and the administration needs to be willing to admit well, hey the administration not... walk into a classroom and say i can do it you don't need a whole government to do that do you charles what do you think and did you know this stuff when you were mid high school could you have taught a class i i don't think i could have taught it okay a class, honestly but um i i have been dealing with a, a lot of uh the academic teaching or, or that that kind of being a student and trying to teach other students, uh, I'm, I'm kind of involved in that kind of process at the university. I, I don't think with, with how things are right now, I don't think it's possible for a student to do that. I think there needs to be a little more flexibility in, in the academic world for students to be able to do that. Uh, there's a lot of pushback from academia, I should say. You would not be permitted to do it? Uh, it's saying? it's just a little difficult. Uh, you need permission from uh, faculty to, yeah. to go into their classroom and... Let me ask you a different question. Do you feel now you are capable of doing it? Now? Yeah. Uh, I, I would say so, yeah. So, Frank, how do we make this so? Well, should we? <laughs> no, I, I, I do think that there are a lot of initiatives, and I agree with you. You don't have to wait to get all the approval, and, and you just need a couple of uh, uh, projects that kickstart some of this uh, uh, at a very local level. That said, I do think we do need to scale some of these efforts, and, and, and that's why I was bringing up these two, two little countries that live in tough neighborhoods, Israel and, and Estonia. They've got some, some tough neighbors and have been on the, 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 the pointy end and, and victimized from cyber attacks in the past. So if you look at 
how they're able to punch above their weight in these particular issues, it's largely because they're teaching these skills at the very youngest levels. So uh, I used to bring my graduate students, I, I ran an MBA with a focus on cybersecurity to do a practicum in Estonia every year. And in addition to meeting all the ministers and all the companies and all the Skypes of the world, I would, ha I would spend literally half a day in a elementary school and, and in gymnasium, their equivalent of high school. Mm -hmm. and, and in kindergarten, they are quite literally the equivalent of kindergarten learning Estonian, English, coding, and basic robotics. Once they start figuring out kids are going into that, they would refer to it as the ICT channel and the ICT route in high school. They're trying to make it fun. Technology. That's what I say, say that technology. again. ICT means what? Go say ahead. it again. Information communication technology. Right. So the, 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 the European version of cyber, I guess, yeah, yeah, is yeah, sort yeah. of another way to... And, and once they're in high school, those that are focused in that area, they have all sorts of uh, ways to try to incentivize and make it fun. So one, one teacher that I would visit each year, she would give each year that their, their freshman equivalent would be getting a, uh, an iPad in essence. And they would start the year with their five classes with Fs and they had to, they would end with an F unless they could hack the system and change the grade. So it was monitored in a safe kind of environment so they're not breaking into systems but they're incentivizing and, and and here's the bottom line whether it's vicky whether it's charles whether it's anyone i think curiosity is number one skill in any of these issues yep and if you make kids curious you make it a little bit of fun or you put a little scare in them that they're going to end up with uh, a bunch of f's you're going to find kids are creative and they come up with different ways to break down systems, break down problems, and ultimately come up with solutions. So to me, reverse engineering all of this becomes really important. And quite honestly, everything we're talking about here, even what I've been looking at, Vicki and Charles are already light years ahead and, and, and kids behind them are going to be light years ahead of them. So, so what we need to do is make it fun. Well, all right, so let's talk about fun and danger for a second because there's something really appealing about creating the worst possible situation and doing it, right? And that's an interesting way to learn. And I'm gonna reference Steve Wozniak for that, um, who before he founded Apple would hack phone systems, right? They actually, there was one story about, they were trying to get through to the Pope, the two Steves, Jobs and Wozniak. Do you know the story? And um, they, uh, uh, and they, they actually got through, through their crazy phone freak stuff, they actually got all the way through and he's about to pick up, but they're 17 years old and they just start laughing and they hang up, they blew it. <laughs> Isn't that great? So, it is. it, so, you know, as we're talking about this, the, you know, the, the sort of game person in me is thinking, well, why don't we just have kids create the worst possible scenarios and see how far they can get? Now that's terrifying in, in, you know, in, in, in the realm of, well, now are we creating a whole new generation of troublemakers or as in the case of Wozniak, is it the best way to learn? Um, and I'll give you one more small piece there. I didn't know much, I was seventh grade, didn't know much about drugs or marijuana or heroin or any of that. And a member of the police department came by with a big blanket and showed us all these things. And then none of my friends had ever, ever knew what a drug was. By the end of eighth grade, we had a mess on our hands. Okay, so how do you think about this? Ethics has to be part of that. I don't disagree with the premise, but you need to teach ethics early. And since I brought up Star Wars, and quite honestly, I haven't seen any of the new Star Wars, right. we, we need to be on the, on, the, on, on the side of the light. So there is a dark side. So ultimately, you need people who know how to break into systems to defend systems. The key is how do we ensure that we get them to work for the good guys and not, and not, uh, not the bad guys. So Vicki, you, you've been dealing with this for a little while. Do you have conversations with people about the dark side? Like, is, is that a thing? It is, I don't have conversations about it enough. I think it's super fun and interesting to talk about because in order to defend from you know, the dark side, you kind of have to tiptoe and sort of think like the dark side. 
Suzanne, you've encountered the dark side a few times, I'm guessing. Yeah, and, uh, and Vicki's exactly right. In the intelligence community, where I spent many years, we call it red teaming, right? You gotta put yourself in your adversary's mindset and think if I were the bad guy, where would I go? What would I do? How would I do this? How would I accomplish this? And that puts you in a much better position to defend against it. I do wanna say, um, Howard, that one of the things I learned from being in that uh, position of, of seeing, uh, and thinking about our vulnerabilities and trying to figure out how we reduce the risks is that it's not always gonna be a technical solutions. It's not just about the wonderful Vickies and Charles's of the world, um, but it's about the folks who think about how to manage risks generally. And so for the teachers out there and administrators who are not technical, who are feeling a little overwhelmed at a, at a you know, technical challenge that seems to require a technical solution. Um, let me say that I have, when I work with CEOs and boards uh, of companies, they aren't technical experts, but they do know about managing risks to their operations. And so do all of you, right? You are, you are sadly trained now in how to deal with an active shooter situation. You are trained in how to deal with snow days, with storms, with all kinds of risks. And so you have readiness plans, right? You thought through what is your backup plan and what's the backup plan to that? So we go all the way back, Howard, to your first scenario. Whatever it is that causes you to not be able to engage in that distance learning during the pandemic, for example, have you thought about what's your plan B? How have you have you you know talked to students about if we lose power for several days? Here's a list of things you can do on your own. Here's a, here's some resources you have at your disposal in your house. Here's you know, something so that you're thinking as school administrator, you know, I know that a lot of this planning for, for trying to reopen schools, it's all about contingency planning. And so much of cybersecurity risk management comes down to that. The story of the folks in Ukraine who got the power back on by sending guys out in trucks, right? The paper ballots that we're talking about to deal with the cyber threats to our elections. That's not, I mean, you know, some people think of that as a technical solution, but it's not a, it, it's a, it's an, I call it an analog solution to a digital threat, right? Um, going back to have paper ballots that can give you a clear audit trail, right? So. But people by and large are horrible planners. They make decisions on the worst, po in the worst possible way. So, and well, I'll give you two quick examples. One of them is retirement planning which is a complete disaster in most US households. And the second is at this pandemic I've heard about. Yeah. We did no. not plan for that. So if we're such bad planners, and I, I hang out with a lot of the professors at University of Pennsylvania, and it, particularly in the decision sciences world, and they are mystified time and again by the behavior component. I understand the planning component, People just don't behave that way, not in large numbers. They have a terrible time thinking beyond the immediate horizon. They don't put pieces together in reasonable ways that we would associate with critical thinking or what I would call clear thinking. And yet, that's exactly what we need them to do. So help. Yeah, well, listen, preparedness folks have struggled for decades and decades, you know, how to get beyond the one third who will take all the uh, preparedness activities and do what they're told, the middle that waits to be told what to do and will follow instructions, and then the third that won't do, won't, will ignore instructions and won't do anything. Uh, right. It's an age old problem. Here's what I would say, though, for those who are in, in who are managing institutions, so for the, for the school boards, for the district administrators, uh, for the principals of the schools, go to um, schoolsafety.gov and the readiness planning materials are there for cybersecurity. Uh, and you just, you, you, you can't ignore it. And the help is there. When we want to do retirement planning, no one can make you do retirement planning, but they also don't make you do it when you decide to do it by yourself. You turn to Howard, an Howard, can I add one thought? Because I think it really is important. You brought up behavior and uh, the the and not to be trite but one of my favorite lines in all this is technology changes human nature remains pretty consistent whether good or bad 
the reality is, is you need to look at this not only through the computer science lens, not only through the cybersecurity lens, you need to integrate cyber into existing curricula in other fields, whether it's international affairs. You have to understand that China, Russia, Iran, any, any country you're looking at, whether it's uh, bilaterally, multilaterally, and the whole like, and, and the same with psychology and the same with other sets of issues. So it does need to be cross-cutting. And, and let me just say on your planning concept, just because the Solarium Commission was uh, President Eisenhower's baby, my favorite line from President Eisenhower was, in preparation for battle, I have found plans to be useless but planning to be indispensable. In other words, you're not gonna have this simple checklist that you just have to go through to get everything done. But if you think through scenarios, if you make it fun, if you find ways to engage students, at least they're thinking about it to get to that critical or clear thinking skill set of issues before the bomb goes off, the, 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 the power goes out, whatever scenario you wanna look at, left of a crisis. So to me, that is not about cybersecurity. It's not just the cyber ninjas. That's just education. Charles, are you getting that kind of education? Do you see that growing up around you? Or is that not exactly how you're being taught or have you been taught over the last 10 years? No, I, I would say that clear thinking and critical thinking is uh, definitely part of our curriculum at Auburn. Um, yeah. And do you think student, I mean, it's great that people are teaching you. Do you think people are learning it? I, I believe so, yeah. Okay, hey, Vicki, how about you? I believe so as well. And at my um, high school, so we always had to bring our own laptops to school. And one way that they helped us learn and to enforce, like even good cyber hygiene, is we had to have a secure password to get into our computer and take a quiz about it and to even allow our, our computer to be able to access the internet. And so I think that was a good tool to get people to think of good, strong passwords and we had to change them every so often or we would get locked out of our computers. There we are. All right, well, we have done, this has been a very informative hour. Thank you all, as is our usual habit, we're gonna roll the credits and then we can all hang out and just chat for a minute if, if the time allows. Thanks everybody for watching. Um, next week, we are talking about, we're coming back to another aspect of this, which is broadband, particularly the problem that I don't think two out of three students in the United States has reliable, fast broadband service. And I'm beginning to see research that's supporting that. So how are you doing distance learning if only a third of the people can do distance learning? So I'll leave you with that for the week. We'll see you next Thursday. Thank you. demand episodes, and more, visit our website. Kids on Earth contains hundreds of video interviews with students from around the world. Learning Revolution is a global collaboration network for people who care about learning. Be sure to join us next Thursday for a new episode of Reinventing School. Thanks for watching.